Welcome back to another episode of Not Even D2, the podcast covering Division Three sports through interviews with those involved in Division Three. On today's episode, we have one of the best coaches in Division Three, who runs one of the most unique systems in all of college basketball. But before we get into his system and Coach Arsenal at Grinnell College, we wanted to talk about Coach Hastings, uh, the head coach at Keene State, who was recently released and in an article says he won't be considered for the permanent head coaching job. And the reason being nothing to do with talent or what he was doing strictly because he doesn't have a bachelor's degree. So Ruda and I, we got some thoughts about it. So let's start with you, Ruda. What, what, what are your thoughts? Hey, man, first first thing I wanted to say, it's the first time I'm jumping on, you know, one of these intros. And I just want to say I appreciate you, you know, letting me, again, letting me do this and uh, run this podcast game with you and um, bigger things to come. So I, I wanted to say that to you real quick on air. Yeah, no doubt, bro. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, with Coach Hastings, man, uh, like the article said something about a bachelor's degree. I don't know if that's the real reason why. Maybe there's an underlying issue there. But all I know is is that Coach Hastings knows basketball. He's been around the game for a very long time. If you listen to the pod, he has, he's been around a lot of top coaches, Calipari, uh, Patino. I'm pretty sure he mentioned him. And, you know, chief of police served for the countries. And, you know, Keene State went to the Sweet 16 this year. And, yeah, they have a good team. But regardless, it takes, you know, good coaching and get players that, to get players to that, you know, type of mindset and uh, to play that well. Um, so it's definitely sad to see um, that, you know, he's not going to be back there. But I'm sure he's going to land back on his feet. Yeah. One thing I wanted to talk about, like you just said, he was the chief of police, but he can't coach. He can be the acting head coach, but he can't be the permanent head coach. That To me, those two different sides don't really can't really exist at the same time. And also you can see in every post game conference Keen State has, you can see the love they have for Coach Hastings. Like he really has that locker room and to see that they're just going to throw that all away because of a piece of paper even though he served for the, our country, which we always try to prove or say to people, you should go fight for your country. But then when it comes back to him, he, he can't get that same respect. So like you said, sad to see, but we're definitely rooting for Coach Hastings and wherever you land, we're, we're supporters. But back to today's episode with Coach Arsenal, uh, like I said, one of the most unique systems in college basketball where it's called the system. And I'm not going to describe what it is, but what I really like about this episode is how insightful he is. And he's showing us that, like, it's OK to use basketball as like an expiratory type of thing. He's using that. He's just trying different things. And some people don't like his philosophy of basketball, which I think is hating. But like it takes courage to be able to implement something in your system and try it at different levels of basketball. So I definitely have a lot of respect for Coach Arsenal. I mean, yeah, just building off what you said, it takes a lot of courage, too. Like, you asked I'm, – I'm, I don't want to, like, you know, uh, give any spoilers, but you asked them, you know, have you ever thought about, you know, changing um, your system for, uh, you know, at any time in your, you know, coaching career? And he said, not really, only by, you know, only if it was necessary, you know, because of the G League, but I don't want to talk too much about that. But, yeah, I mean, I think he's a great coach. Um, he's a good guy. I mean, his energy is just – you know, you could feel it through the screen. Like, he was asking us questions. Um, some of the rapid fires, you know, he was, you know, building off of what we said. Um, and he just knows ball, man. He knows ball. And, and he did, he doesn't like to give himself credit um, when it comes to like the new age of basketball. But I think, you know, when it comes to when we look back at um, the shift in pace of play or getting threes up, he's definitely part of that conversation for sure. Yeah. So definitely stay tuned to hear all about Coach Arthur Nolte's career playing coaching at different levels and some of his most memorable games and coaching games so really fun episode hope you guys enjoy um and enjoy the episode i'm here with co-host naruda and coach dave how you how you guys feeling today? I'm feeling pretty good, KJ. I'm excited to start this interview. We got a great guest ahead. Do we I'm, ever? I'm excited to be here. Honored, humbled to be here. Let's get it rolling. All right. <laughs> um, I just want to hear a little about the life of a basketball coach at this point of the year. Like, do you how much free time do you have? What are your hobbies outside of basketball? Let's hear about that. 
Yeah, so this is actually the my first year at Grinnell College where I'm not also doubling as the head women's golf coach. So Jeez. normally right after hoop season, I'd be getting straight into into like golf mode and, and they changed that this year. And so, uh, you, you know, but for me, I actually was a NCAA site rep at the Division Three tournament, the first round of the tournament at, up at UW Platteville. So for me, that was a great experience. And of course, it's like it's it's recruiting grind and uh, trying to find guys. Admission decisions are coming out, get some more visits, that that type of thing. But uh, no, outside of, outside of basketball, I hang out with my my family. My wife and I have three kids, ages six, four, and two. Uh, I like to play golf. Uh, you know, that's probably why I was a golf coach as well. I, I love to play golf, like to fish, like to like to just. Uh... Oh, and I also love collecting sports cards, basketball cards specifically. Ooh. So I'm I'm really I'm really okay. into that and. Now, now during the season, I probably don't spend as much money on them, but now I can spend some money on them. <laughs> what's your What's your favorite card you have? Oh well, I I really collect like '90s, like from from my my day where I where I grew up, uh, you know, and and I I, I collect Hakeem Olajuwon, Michael Jordan, of course, Shaquille O'Neal. Those are really the three guys I collect. You might need to buy something off you. <laughs> okay, you you collect what? I don't, but I I do like uh, basketball cards and baseball. I might those. need to start. We might need to start. We might need to start. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's fun. It's addicting, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> I had one question for you. What does the spring training look like for your guys? Like, are you getting them in the weight room, pick up? What does that look like? Yeah, so out, out of season, like, uh, I can make a recommended plan to everybody. And, we, you know, we go through and we have an individual meeting and, and we talk about kind of what the recommended plan should be and then talk with the captains about what a recommended plan for the whole team is. Uh, the mm -hmm. guys usually lift three days a week and, and work out with our strength and conditioning coach. Uh, and then they'll play a different three days a week and they'll just play like open gym for an hour, an hour 15 usually. And it doesn't really resemble how we play during the season, which I think is good. Uh, <laughs> although maybe they're not playing a lot of defense and they're probably chucking up a lot of threes, but so, th so maybe there are some similarities, but we're not doing like the full court pressing and, you know, yeah. and stuff and stuff like that. Yeah. So let's get into um, your playing career a little bit. Obviously, you're a great coach, but you're also a great player. Your senior year, you led the nation in assists at 10.2 per game. Uh, but you're also a great scorer. You're 11th in Grinnell history, over 1,400 points. And, you know, everybody tries to mirror their game after somebody. So I want to hear who had the biggest influence on you as a player. Man, that's a that's a that's a good question. Um in, in, in terms of, in terms of, a, a another player, like, I, I don't know. I, I, I just always grew up liking to set up a teammate more than I'd like to score. And uh, you know, I played for my dad at Grinnell. Uh, my mom actually was the one who always wanted me to shoot more. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if my dad really cared or cared or not. My mom was always saying, you could have shot, you could have scored more. And I was like, mom, that's not, that's not what I feel like gets the team going, you know? And so, uh, of course, NBA players that like got a got a ton of assists, like uh, again that I was watching kind of growing up, like John Stockton. Even though I actually was a huge a huge Houston Rockets fan, and and the Rockets and the Jazz were always battling it out, but just kind of seeing the way that he would play and his unselfishness, I, I mean, I I enjoyed that. I actually got a chance to coach his son in the D League too, which was pretty cool. Uh, um, you know, but but somebody like that, and then even like in in this day and age, like when I started seeing how Chris Paul would play you know, just like the patience. And I mean, that, that guy's incredible. Just, just being able to see everything. Love, love his game. Yeah. Uh, CP is definitely my favorite player. So I respect you even more for liking Chris Paul. Um, I saw that you had 34 assists in a game. So what were you like kind of looking at and how were you able to be such an effective point guard? Yeah. So like with the way that we play and we sub in five guys, you know, the first whistle after 35 seconds on that particular game, we actually rotated four guys and I just kind of stayed on the floor for a lot of it. <laughs> and uh, we did this. We've done the same thing a few other times we did when Jack Taylor scored 138 points. And, and uh, uh, yeah, you know, so I was getting like a lot of, a lot of touches in different spots, finding teammates. And then at halftime, I just remember my old man in the locker room being like, everybody is free to shoot as long as it comes off a pass from David. And I was like, Oh, this is kind of cool. Okay. So, so now they're just like, they're happy as hell. Cause as soon as I get the ball, they know if I pass it to them, they're just, they're just hoisting it, you know? Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of how the game plan and how it, how it came about, um, you know, looking back, I, 
I think I had 22 points in the game. I wish I wouldn't have gotten, I wish I wouldn't have scored as much. I would have gotten gone for more assists. Um, you know, I still think somebody's going to get a 50 assist game here, here, here pretty soon at, at, uh, at some level. Hopefully it's a, hopefully it's somebody for me playing for me at Grinnell. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I think it's really cool that your coach, um, that your dad rather, and your coach is instilling confidence in you like that. Like, no, like people would need to shoot when you pass, when, when you get, when you get a pass from you, I think that's really dope. Yeah, man, I, I, I just feel like, uh, so much of like playing the game of basketball, is just about confidence, you know, mm-hmm. like with the amount of work that guys are putting in year round, you know, like all of that can just be crushed. If, if somebody is just like, Oh, don't take that shot. You know, well, they just spent the entire summer taking like a thousand shots every single day, you know, and, and all that work can just be gone, like in a, in a split second. So um, that doesn't mean that I don't get all my guys and yell at them from time to time. Cause I, I, cer- <laughs> I certainly do, but, but I, 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 I am trying to, you know, recognize just the importance of like instilling confidence in in your players. Yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you, obviously you talked about how you're an unselfish player, but you obviously got a lot of accolades because of your assists, because of your stats rather with your assists and how much you scored. And you were a three-time finalist for the Bob Cousy point guard of the year award. And that's an award mostly given to division one players. How did it feel for you to receive that type of recognition at your, at the division three level? Yeah, it was, it was, it was a humbling experience. I mean, honored to be considered with, with an award that, you know, pretty much every year it's only division one guys that are, that are nominated for uh, or win. And I recognized like my fortunate position of playing in the Grinnell system because the Grinnell system is totally a guard driven offense. And when you're trying to play with a 12 second shot clock, you know, you don't have time to throw it into the post and then them kick it back out and throw it back into the post. Like it's just guards going and making plays and quick shots. And so, you know, uh, I, I was making a lot of passes to shots that maybe wouldn't have been taken in more conventional games. Uh, but because of how we play, I was, I was fortunate to kind of be in that spot, but no, it's, it's a, it's, it's a great honor. Yeah. So at Grinnell, we talked about you're playing under your father and growing up, you know, some, some people are always just like, he's that good or he's getting that playing time because he's playing under his dad or, you know, his dad has a big influence on the team. So what was kind of your experience playing under your father at the college level? Yeah. Uh, like it's, it was great. I mean, my, my old man was my, my best man in my wedding. So he and I get along great. Uh, I knew pretty much since I was in like seventh or eighth grade that I wanted to go to Grinnell and, and play for my dad. And, you know, it's like, I think everybody grows up learning the game a different way, obviously. And like the way that I grew up learning and watching basketball being played was the Grinnell system, which is, uh, you know, a crazy. So that was just kind of like in my brain at all times, even as I'm playing high school basketball or whatever. And so, um, and then I would always come over, you know, starting in eighth grade in the off season, I just play open gyms with the Grinnell college team, you know? And so I just got to, I, I got a feel for the guys. I got a feel for campus and everything. And and for me, it was like a no brainer. I just need to keep my grades up so that I could get into Grinnell. Uh, but for me, it was like a no brainer to, 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 to want to come play for my dad. How do you think that um, in high school playing with those type of guys, like helped your game at, at the high school level? Yeah, it was, it was, it was fantastic. Like, and they also were, super friendly and nice to me maybe because they had to because they were playing for my dad <laughs> right like and I wasn't on the team you know so they 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 didn't always just send my shot into the third row or something <laughs> like that um but for me it was great like I'm just playing against guys that are bigger faster stronger and as as and as I got more comfortable and as I got older like into my junior senior year of high school it also just kind of gave me confidence I was like oh I can play with these guys right now in open gyms I'm definitely going to be able to play with them when I when I actually get to college and I'm ready to go so shortly after you graduated, you ended up coaching with your coaching with your father at Grinnell. And, you know, now hearing that your father was your best man at your wedding and obviously he's been around, he's been around your whole your whole life. Um, is there anything that you learned like something? It, was there something that you learned that's new about him when you started like coaching with him? Like, oh, damn, I didn't see this part of my dad. Like, oh, this is something new about him. Or is there anything new like that or no? Yeah, I didn't realize how much time he spent like formulating the groups with the, that we play with, like play in on the court. 
Like, so the way that we're doing an acronym, like, well, for this year, for example, we basically played three groups of five guys, you know, and uh, rotated those three kind of like hockey shifts, like, like, you know, the first whistle after 35 seconds. And, and, you know, it, we try to make all three groups effectively even groups, you know, which in, in just, he, he would just spend like hours and hours scribbling these different combinations of players down and like all this stuff. And, and, and for me, that was like really eye opening. It was like, Oh, it's more than just like, you know, when you're a player, you just kind of like show up and you're like, Oh, the practice plan's ready to go. I'm just, I'm, I'm, you know, you're, you're stretching out and getting yourself mentally prepared. But you know, that for me was, was the most eye opening thing I'd say. Yeah. Uh, the viewers probably heard the Grinnell system or the system a few times and wondering what that is. So the system is a fast paced, fast tempo, three point hunting system, your philosophy. And you were a big part, I assume, in that like the creation of that. So talk to me about um, how that started and how it's developing over time. Yeah, it uh it started like in the early 90s. My dad took over at Grinnell in 1989. It started in the in the very early 90s. Grinnell just had this this um you know, unfortunate tradition of of losing and and losing a lot and and uh you know, now now don't really get it twisted. Like we're not can we're not we're not playing this weekend in the in the final four, you know? Like we're not we didn't even make the NCAA tournament, but but at least at this point, you know, that Grinnell had had 30 consecutive losing seasons or something like that before my dad got here. And so now for us, like, um, you know, we have goals to play in the NCAA tournament, but, but it's, 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 we should be at the top of our conference, near the top of our conference competing like that. And, and so, um, yeah, when he started it, it was just a matter of really desperation, you know, and, and wanting to try something new and give the guys something positive to talk about when Grinnell was inevitably going to lose a basketball game. Why not score 120 points and lose, you know, instead of score 40 and lose? I don't know. And so, you know, now the best way I could describe it is like, well, here, I'll, t- I'll, fl- I'll turn this on you guys. Like if, if you were to imagine your team was down by 10 points with a minute left, uh, except that you weren't allowed to like intentionally foul to send them to the free throw line, how would you envision your team playing? You know, like trapping you... them, yeah. trapping them, trying to steal the ball, shooting a lot, taking of the, the most confident three pointers ever. Because at that point, why not? Yeah, exactly. You know, and you're and you're and, and and Rudy, you're exactly right. Like we're trapping, we're just gambling for seals. We're we're trying to be completely unafraid to get scored on. If they break our press and dunking on us, you know, so what? We were already down, right? Like in that situation, it's like so what? We were already down by ten. You know, there was nothing what have we lost and so we're trying to basically play like that for a full 40 minutes now yeah. it doesn't mean we want to get dunked on we want to get a steal and force turnover you know it just means that uh that a byproduct of sometimes double teaming and gambling a lot is they might beat you over the top for a dunk but at least it's happening quick and we can run yeah i was reading online about the system i'm just going to explain it a little bit more so here's some of the rules or like strategy you have so first pop first possible shot the best shot right? First shot is the best shot, 12 second shot clock. <laughs> as many threes as possible. That is also correct. I mean, we will take layups, but l- come on, man. Three is greater than two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel you. <laughs> All right. So on the defensive end, un- an uncontested layup is better than the other team getting a shot clock violation. Man, that is definitely true for my dad. My dad was crazier than I am for sure. He really only cared about how many points his team scored. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know about that anymore. But it's close. <laughs> I, the, the 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 philosophy is there, right? Like we want to try to get the ball back in ten seconds. We're going to force the pace so much that you're going to have to take a quick shot against us. Okay. Always double the ball. One hundred percent accurate. We never scout another team's half court offense. I have no idea what anybody else in in our conference <laughs> runs because we're just double teaming it wherever it goes. Okay, that's crazy. Every person crashes besides the shooter. One hundred percent true. Our shooter. So if you were to take KJ, if you were to take a corner three, you got to rotate like around the arc to the top of the key. The other four guys are going like madmen to the offensive glass, and if they get the offensive rebound they're kicking it right back to you at the top of the key for a second three-point shot. Yeah, that that was my sixth rule, that offensive rebound right back is worse. If you get a putback, kick it out for a three. That's a better shot. So any shooter looking to get some shots up, 
I think I got the system for you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. One one thing I want to ask, and I'm kind of skipping ahead a little bit, but there's there's obviously a lot of rules and little intricacies that come within your system. So for a freshman, like, what is that like learning process like? Yeah. Um, so that's it, Bruta. That's a great question. Um, it can take a little time. Um, mostly it's, I think that like first years when they're coming in or freshmen, when they're coming in, they're like, what is the deal with this substitution pattern? What do you mean? I'm going to be subbed out 35 seconds after I just got on the floor. Like, what if I make two threes, you're still going to sub me out. And I'm like, well, yeah, actually, I actually, I am, you know? And so like that, I think just like mentally getting them uh, ready for what the rhythm and what the flow is going to be like. And then I also just think like the speed, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's one thing to be it, pl playing an open gym, you know, then you get into practices and, and even in conventional ball, basketball practices are a little, everything is a little quicker. You know, the, the speed of play is a little quicker. Then you get to a scrimmage. It's a little quicker Then you get into an actual game. And it's like, man, this is, this thing is going fast, you know, and the same applies to us just on maybe a, a great, a more magnified scale because of the speed we're trying to play at. Um, another thing too, like a lot of, a lot of coaches talk about players being mentally tough and always, you know, moving on to the next play. But it sounds like to me, like if you're in a player in your system and you don't have a next play, best play mentality, you can't thrive. Is that correct or no? 100% correct. Um, there's like thousands of mistakes made in any, in any basketball game. Like in, in um, I just try to get our guys, if you're going to make a mistake, which you probably are, uh, make sure you're making it at like 100% speed. You know, and 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 we can live with that. And then also make sure that you don't couple one mistake with the second mistake. I actually end up going and sitting down at the end of the bench. I got my chair like right down there on the corner of the baseline sideline, uh, watching watching the action go. First of all, because all the subs get in the way. Second of all, because I just need to like watch and see what's going on. You know, and I'm not gonna I'm not making subs because somebody is playing poorly. Really. Um. Anyways, I already have it scripted out, and so so uh, I'm just I I just gotta go down there and hang out. I guess. I got a question about the system. Obviously, like you said, it's not perfect. You guys don't win every game. Was there ever a moment in your coaching career where you were like, uh, I think I'm going to move away from uh, this philosophy? So um, not not when I've been at at Grinnell. Um, you know, I had I did have to adjust it when I went to the D League, now G League for two years just because it's a different set of rules really like you know and so i don't know if you want me to talk about that now or later but like it was it was that that was the only time where i looked at things and i was like huh and in in it's not what we did at grinnell's not going to work in the g league just like i would if i were to uh be advising somebody who were like i'm going to start running the system i'd be like well you can start by trying to do it how we do it at grinnell but the reality is you're going to have to adjust it to to your set of circumstances, you know, whether that's the type of, of student athletes you can get, whether that's the rules in, in, in whatever level of basketball you're playing, you know, even if it's another division three school, you can't run it exactly like Grinnell. It's like, it fits us here at Grinnell. It's not, it's not going to, some principles might apply, but everything's not going to fit the same. Under the system, Jack Taylor, we kind of skipped over it, but he's exploded for 138 points, an NCAA single game record. Um, he shot 52 for 108 from the field, 27 for 71 from three, which is just crazy stats. So talk to me about that game. And when did you guys realize like, oh, this dude could like actually do like make a record? I just want to hear about that day and the game he was having. Yeah, um, man, even hearing you read those numbers, it's crazy to think about, like after seeing a full <laughs> season of our box scores and. You know, I thought we had the guy that led the country in scoring this year, but he never shot, you know, the number of shots is just mind boggling. Um, um, yeah. So for, for Jack, like the, the thing about Jack Taylor is like, if you give Jack Taylor the basketball in a one-on-one -on -one situation, he's going to create his own shot. He's only like, he's only like five ten, but he's got like this high release above his head and he really, really quick and would just elevate. Now it's a shot that, probably I'm the only coach in the country that would be acceptable. Okay. With him shooting. 
uh, but he could make it one out of three times, you know? And so I was like, well, geez, he can take this shot four seconds into the shot clock. We're going to get this game going up and down like crazy, you know? And so heading into the game, you know, we had this game plan where we wanted to get Jack Taylor a touch every time down the floor. And we were going to rotate groups of four around him. And, you know, deep down, I was kind of thinking, and my dad was kind of thinking, well, geez, if you give Jack Taylor a touch, you know, what's going to happen. He's going to, he's going to shoot it because he can create a shot every single time, you know? So it, the plan wasn't like directly, Hey, he's the only guy that gets to shoot the basketball. No, it was like, let's see if we can get him a touch every time down the floor. Also knowing that depending on how they're playing, I mean, he's probably going to be able to get it created as, as many shots as he wants to. Yeah. When a player's going off like that, I'm, curious how opponents are reacting he scored 138 was there ever a moment when the other team is sending a double at him or face guarding yeah they were face guarding they started sending doubles at him but you know the thing is like he, he's so quick off the dribble it was just like awkward timing as to when you know it wasn't like if it's a if it's a really good post player you can kind of figure out when you're going to send a double to them you know, or where you're going to send it. When it's a guard dribbling out by half court or like catching it on the wing, it's really hard to immediately send somebody unless you want to kind of abort all of your defensive principles. And, and then the other thing was the game was going so fast up and down. You know, uh, the other team had a guy that scored 70 or 72 in the game. Like it was, for, for, for a stretch there, you know, like we'd be scoring, they'd be throwing it deep and scoring like three seconds later. And like, like it's just kind of going back and forth. So um yeah, it's not. It was. It was more really a, a testament to to Jack's ability to create shots than anything. One thing. One thing I'm kind of wondering about, just watching a lot of the the clips of his, you know, historic night. Um, a lot of these shots, like, have you seen him practice these shots before that he was shooting, or is it more so he was just in the zone and he was taking whatever look the defense gave him? Oh, it's so funny you asked that. Like in our opening tournament that year. I, I don't, I could check the exact, he was something like six for 34 from the three point line in the first two games, like taking all these shots. And I remember my dad and I would be like asking him, I actually called him in and be like, Jack, can you make these shots? Like, you know, they were like right there. They're just like in and out. And we're yeah. like, can you make these shots? And he's looking at us and, and he's like, yeah, coach, I can make them. And we're like, okay, great. And then he would be leave and I'd be like, I don't think he can make them, dad. I don't know what he's talking about here, you know? And so, so we, yeah. So it was also like in a way trying to instill more confidence in him, right? Like he had a terrible shooting performance in the first two games, though we won both games and trying to instill, instill a little confidence in him to, to, to uh, just get him going a little bit. Yeah. It's kind of crazy that game, but the next season he followed it up with 109 points or 108 points. So Duke could just score at all levels and credit to your system. But um, also it was almost 12 years ago that happened and he's still wreaking the benefits of it. ESPN just posted an article a few years ago about it. So I like that. He still got some fame from it. No, but, um, he's, he's, he's a great, he's a great guy too. He came back like, He's always supportive with because all you know all our guys also just want to meet him because they've heard about this and they're at Grinnell and he came back undercover for one of the open gyms like in the last couple of years where he like put on a mask and you know it was like COVID era he could wear a mask so he was wearing a mask and then about halfway through I think some of the guys started being like who is this guy that's taking all these crazy shots you know and so it was kind of cool for our guys too. Yeah, that's a really good story. But um, let's take a quick break. We'll we'll be back in a second. And we're back. So I read an article online that over the summer, basically, you got an email from a Sacramento, Sacramento Kings rep, basically just inquiring about your interest to coach for their G League team. Is that right or no? Yeah, yeah, that's no, that's 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 pretty much correct. I got an email and it was like, hey, this is so and so from the from the Sacramento Kings. Can you give me a call? And okay. and or something like that. And so when I can give them a call, they asked if I had interest in being the head coach of their G League team. So to to ask so to ask you a question, what were your emotions and how did it feel for you to at that time during the hiring process? Um I I was so naive that I didn't even know what to think other than I, you know, part of me thought it was a little bit of a joke. Like when I came into the office that day and told my dad, he was like, surely they're not talking to you for their head coaching position. It's like, no, I think that they said the head coaching position. No, now I'm starting to second guess myself. Like in the moment, I'm like, I don't know. I, 
And, uh, um, you know, it was also just like a little bit strange because I had thought like, okay, you know, if you're applying for a job, you need to have a resume, you need to have a cover letter, you need to send people your list of references. And they didn't ask for any of that stuff. They just called me up and said, Hey, are you interested? And I was like, yeah. And then they were like, Hey, okay, we're going to fly you out here. We'll be in touch here soon. We're going to get you out here and you can tell us what, what, you know, you know, go through it. And so I like brought this made like a resume and brought it with me and nobody even asked for it. You know, it was just kind of, it was just kind of uh, it was, it was, it was very, very different. Yeah. That's wild. Um, so obviously like, you were the coach of a D league team and those guys have high level uh, division one careers. They play under some top coaches, you know, at the division one level and you're just in quotes, a division three guy. So did it take any time for those guys to buy into your system? For sure. I mean, when I stepped in, I had guys on the team that were older than me, you know, I think I was, I was maybe 27 or 28 at the time. And, and um, you know, guy, yeah, guys that were 33, 34 that had been 10, 12 year overseas veteran players. And, and, um, you know, when I, when I first explained it, I got some looks like, what is he even talking about right now? You know, and, and uh, we tried to install it in pieces and bits and pieces and obviously starting with the offense first. And, 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 you know, also it was, there were still a lot of threes being taken at the time, but, but not as many as there are like today in in right now basketball, you know, this was 10 years ago or so. And, and so uh, even that was a little bit of a, of a challenge. Like you really want me to take this three point shot three seconds into the shot clock. Yes, I do. Um, And so, yeah, some, some of the, but a lot of the guys ended up buying in very, very quickly, you know, and, and, and I think once they saw kind of how it was going to open up their game, especially offensively and the statistics they were going to be able to accrue, which, was that's which that's really half the battle in terms of getting a look from another team, whether it's domestically or abroad, is is getting the statistics. And I then I feel like I I got some of that trust going. Yeah. Um, so obviously you talked about your new coach and a new setting. What like were you nervous being at that type of level? You're jumping from division three straight to the D League, which is a completely different level. Were you what were your emotions like actually coaching those guys? Yeah, I just couldn't. Um, I, I I just couldn't believe how kind of not not how easy things came for them on the court because like all of these guys were working so freaking hard, like on their bodies, on their game. There's a, we're opening the gym back up at night for extra shooting. Of course, every single guy is there for from open until close, and they're just like not messing around at all, but. But how easy some of the other stuff came to them, like when I would draw up a play on on a, on the on the on the board, you know, coming out of a timeout, like just the fluidity that these guys would move it, move with and how perfectly they would execute it with just a shoulder fake this way before they're going back the other direction. Like to me, that was just like it was it was really fascinating to see um, in terms of me being like nervous personally. Like I at the time I was getting paid like five thousand dollars for the whole season to be the assistant coach at Grinnell College. You know, so I was just like happy as like heck that now I'm able to do my own thing. Um, and and I had a great staff with me out there. Um, and then I ended up hiring somebody else, like other guys to be on my staff year two that I, I knew even better. And I was just more comfortable. And, and they the Kings treated me right. You know, they were super um, just really cordial with their, with their interactions with me and the support that they provided for me. So that that made the transition really easy. So I want to dive more, dive more into that. You talked about in a, so an article you said with Tampa Bay times, you said that the ultimate goal is to provide the Sacramento Kings with something that they can use at the highest level of basketball. So my question to you would be, how does it feel to have an NBA team want to use your own philosophy in their own clubhouse? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's crazy, you know, like in, and that really was the goal, like to obviously, obviously see if we could get a lot of our own guys that we were working with a bigger payday than what the D Lee was paying at the time. Um, but the ultimate goal, like as a representative of the Kings organization was to, can I provide them with something that they can use in the parent club? 
you know, that's going to help make them more competitive, not necessarily just like a player that they could call up because anybody could call up any of my players, you know, but like something that they could take like a tangible statistic or whatever uh, and, and use. And so, uh, yeah, to get the opportunity to even experiment and try it out was fantastic. Not every team is in the NBA is running around doubling the ball whenever, but there, there is a little bit of the system implemented in the NBA today. You know, Tyrese Halliburton talks a lot about how if a team scores, the first thing he's doing is looking up the court to see if he can get the ball up court. So teams are definitely playing at a faster pace and they're looking for like more threes. Some people might not like that, but how does it feel for yourself to know that you have um, no matter how much, but you have some impact on the NBA today? Yeah, I don't know if I have any impact on the NBA today, but I, 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 it certainly feels good like to be on the right side of the direction that the game is going, mm. you know, like, and, and I really just learned it from my dad. So I really don't deserve any of the credit <laughs> and I'm not going to give him too much credit. Cause I don't actually, he's, he's not that smart. He got a little bit lucky here. Let's be real. I, you can't be I, jacking I, I think you're slighting the two of you. I no, think you, you guys do have a little bit of impact. Okay. Well, that's very nice of you guys to say, but, but no, I, I don't know where like the tipping point is for how fast is too fast and how many threes is too many threes. You know, I mean, I know what old school purists would say. They'd say, well, 10 threes is too many, but I'm just saying like in terms of like analytically and in terms of how the game can be played and in terms of how can a team be successful, like how fast can we go? How many threes can somebody take, you know, like on a consistent basis. And I, I, I'm just kind of anxious to see how, how that evolves over here over the next, you know, even handful of years. One one thing I'm curious about during your time in the D League and now the G League, um, did any coaches come up to you like before or after games, like asking you for tips or maybe like, hey, like I like what you do here, like can you help me understand this? I'm kind of wondering that. Yeah, uh, I think that people were maybe a little bit more curious about it, um, <laughs> um, and and just wondering exactly how or why I guess we would want to play that way, but. But yeah, I, I also just think that like coaches generally love to have control and mm -hmm. they love to have control in like their own way. And their own way is how they grew up playing basketball. Like it would be really hard for, if somebody came to me and said like, Hey, you should run the Princeton offense and really slow it down. Like I wouldn't even know where to start like doing that because I've just grown up playing basketball a certain way. Even if the Princeton offense would maybe win us more games or be more successful, I wouldn't even know where to, you know, like, so I, like you'd have to have an open mind to try to make some of those adjustments. Hmm. You talked a little bit earlier about the high level of some of these players, like even in the D league and how like they can make these passes or they can make plays or understand the game at a different level. And you're providing them opportunity by letting them play um, for your team. So how does it feel to provide life-changing opportunities like that for players and young men and sometimes adults too? Yeah, it was, it, it, it was, it was so much fun like getting to know these guys. And it was, it was all sorts of different types of guys. You know, we'd have the guys that were first round NBA draft picks that just didn't make it, you know, and they were looking for a second chance. We had a guy that had spent, you know, a, a time in, in prison and was looking for a second chance. We had guys that went to five schools in four years and, and just kind of bounced around. Uh, we had guys that were talented enough, but they needed to maybe work on one specific either skill or maybe it was like a behavior thing. Like, no, you can't actually just like talk that way to the officials every single time a call doesn't go your way, you know, like, and, and so um, it was, it was so much fun, like seeing that talent level and also like just wanting to help these guys get the, the next opportunity. Right. Because the thing about the D league, at least then, maybe not so much today, because I think it has, it's progressed in a lot of really good ways, in my opinion. But at that time it was like, this is actually a league that nobody really actually even wants to be in. You know, you want to be in the NBA, you know, or yeah. potentially overseas making money uh, where you would be making more money. And, and so, again, I'm very happy that like the way that league has shifted, it shifted in a way that that uh, is better for the players to be able to 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 provide and have opportunities like here in in the States. You coached in the G League for two years, your second year. You had a great coaching career. You guys won the Western Conference. You were 33 and 17, and you set an offensive efficiency D-League record. So the first question I have is, was there any interest from, like, 
the upper MBA, like, do you want an assistant job or anything like that? And the second question is, what was the reason that after that second year, you decided to leave the D-League and go back to Grinnell to coach? Um, you know, I probably should have gotten fired after my first year, KJ, if I'm being honest with you here. Uh, I didn't know that you didn't have that great of a year. No, no, we were terrible. I'm glad you skipped over that for me. That was really nice of you, but I'm just, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna call a spade a spade here. Like, like, and so I actually like the full, the full two year thing. So year one, we did not have a great record. Like I was trying to adjust the system. I got like a 10 man roster and I'm trying to play the Grinnell system. And I'm used to having, we have 20 guys play in, in uniform at Grinnell, you know? And so I can't even rotate like two groups, Never mind if somebody tweaks an ankle or gets into foul trouble. I'm now, I don't even have two full groups. And so, you know, in year two, we adjusted some things. We scored less points. We pressed more selectively. We actually played quite a bit of half court defense, which I wasn't in charge of our half court defense. I can assure you that that, but I was, you know, I, we had to do it just, just to, cause I thought it gave us a better chance to win. And, and, and then they ended up, you know, wanting to just go a different direction and management with the Kings had changed. They didn't renew my contract, which, you know, it's, it, there's no hard feelings. I looked at it as actually a win. Cause I should have been fired. Like I said, after my first year, uh, I looked, I looked around at a few other spots, but at the, around the same time, my, my, my dad told me he was going to retire and, uh, you know, I really didn't have interest from an MBA, like, like to even be a behind the bench or a player development, you know, it just, it just wasn't there. You know, I think a lot of that is like relationships that are built over years and years and years. And I had only been there two years and, and didn't really know anybody, you know, and, 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 uh, it, it, but there was some other stuff in the D league, but for me, it was just like coming back to Grinnell feels like home. You know, okay. I, 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 my, my wife's also a Grinnell alum she was my fiance at the time living in Grinnell that certainly played a role in the whole, the whole thing. And then, and then just the guys that I get to work with at Grinnell and, and uh, the support system here and everything else, it just kind of feels like home. One, th one thing I'm wondering just about, you know, your return to D3, you coached in the D league, you know, with high level players. So now coming back to division three, but we know that division three has high level players, just like those levels. So what was kind of your perspective on that? Like, switching before switching between the two different levels yeah man i mean we i had a guy that that i played with at grinnell that was on my d-league team and you know we took him keith chamberlain was his name and and he would have spent he didn't spend actually that much time with us only because he got hurt he would have spent the entire year with us you know and he could play at that level um you know and in like like D league basketball, G league basketball, professional basketball, and, and the NBA and the G league is really, really good. Um, division three basketball is also really, really good. The very best players in division three can sh for sure play at higher levels. There's no doubt about it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and um, I think there were a few other D three guys that were on just different D league rosters. And so, yeah. So coming back to Grinnell, like there are things that are, are, are definitely different just in terms of, um, you know, maybe some size or some athleticism types of stuff, but there were also a lot of principles, X's and O's spacing wise, how we were going to run practices and, and manage certain situations and late game stuff that like, I could just apply immediately to Grinnell and not have any issues. Like, you know, it, it those guys could handle that, you know, uh, our guys at Grinnell could handle that. Yeah. Yeah. In 2022 transitioning back to your coaching career at Grinnell, you guys set a NCAA record for um, single game, three point attempts in a single game. I just said, um, you guys set the single game record, 111 three pointers, no field goal or no two point field goals. So talk to me about that game and what the mindset was for um, only shooting three pointers. Mm, yeah. Um, this is something that I had been thinking about for probably the better part of 10 years. And uh, I, I try to just come up with different ways. I don't know, different, different ways the game can be played, different records that could be broken, different things that we could test out and experiment with on the basketball court. Like, because why not push the limits, you know, like why not push the limits of the game? Like, like, uh, uh, yes, I understand the importance of winning. Um, but I also understand the importance of like creating memories and having fun and like seeing what can be done. You know, and, and I think that that is that's that's super important life lesson for all of the guys that I'm going to coach at Grinnell is like that, uh, 
that let's see what's possible out there. Let's see what we can do. And so I've been thinking about it, just trying to figure out the right time, the right opponent uh, had kind of thought that this would be, this would be a good time to, to give it a go and just, just see how it worked. And it was also the right team, like my own team that needed to work on specific things that I thought only taking threes could help us work on driving and kicking the basketball out instead of driving and trying to shoot it through three guys, for example, you know? Um, and, and so, uh, uh, the real bummer here, KJ and Ruta, I got the flu and I missed the freaking game. Absolutely. No. I got the no. flu. So I, I wasn't even there. I mean, I, my assistant coach, like it was, it was our game plan together, but I, I missed the game. And so I watched most of it. Uh, but, uh, no, I was thrilled with how it turned out and I go ahead and just to, just to, try something new for the guys to execute it for the guys to buy in speaks volumes to, to, to how they handled it. And um, you guys didn't shoot a horrible percentage, but I can only imagine if you guys were hot that day, you still scored 124 points, but you only shot 36% from three. So if it was more close to like 40%, that would have been crazy. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, but this is also, you know, this is also just a public call out. Uh, cry for if you guys have anything that you're like, huh, I wonder if this could be done on the basketball court. I would gladly take your ideas. <laughs> think about it a little bit. Maybe I'm going to throw it in the trash. Maybe I'm going to be like, you know what? Let's see if we can, let's see if we can use something like this. All right. I'll start thinking. <laughs> Love it. So one thing, one thing I'm curious about, you've been coaching, playing, and I've seen many different types of levels of basketball. And obviously you've been around your dad has been around basketball for a very long time. And, you know, you're seeing you're recruiting freshmen, you're bringing transfers in all the time. So I'm just kind of wondering, what's your biggest piece of advice to a freshman coming into college into a new situation? Yeah, so, you know, it's like. You got you got you got to find a way to 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 both fit in and also forge your own path. Right. Like like because it is important to to, to, to fit into the team setting that you're going to be a part of, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't want to, to create friction within that. You want to, you want to step into this team and, and kind of ingratiate yourself with the, with the, with the other players on the team or the guys on the team and, and bond with them and form this connection. But then at the same time, like you got to be able to forge your own path. Like you got to be, you got to be willing to, to, to on your own work hard, and improve, commit to your studies, commit to treating your body right and getting enough sleep and putting the right things in your body, commit to working on your game, um, you know, and, 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 and getting better. And so I think the combination of those two things, like for me would be, would be the advice on, on the route to go. Yeah. We talked to a lot of guests asking them a similar type of question to end the episode and everyone kind of says like, you know, fall in line, do little things, but I really appreciate that you said, like, you got to forge your own path. People always say, like, you're a freshman. You just got to, like, take the back seat for a few years. That is your time. But I like how you're you're telling people, like, as a freshman, you do have to do some of those little things, stay behind, but also, like, be be yourself and create your own path. So appreciate that. But um, during the break, you said uh, you asked if you could ask us any questions. So. Um, before we get into rapid fire and starting five, do you want to do that or you want to get into? Oh, yeah, yeah. Fire? I got a question for you guys. So we start out practice like every single day, taking a hundred threes after our stretch and our warm up. Hundred threes, eighteen minutes on the clock. You got a partner in a basketball. It's twenty five shots from four spots. You can pick your four favorite spots, and then and like twenty five shots and switch, and your partner goes. And that's going to take eighteen minutes for the two of you to each get up one hundred shots. So I'm just curious, Rudy and KJ, if you guys were partnered up right now taking a hundred threes, not only who would make more, how many out of 100 would you make? It's going to be inside out passes. It's going to be like perfect passes from the three point line, 25 shots at a time. How many out of a hundred are you guys making? All right. I want to start by saying this isn't really a fair question because my, one of my weaknesses, I wouldn't say weakness, but a small part <laughs> of my game is shooting threes and Ruta's biggest strength is shooting threes. So who's going to make more? That's kind of a hard question. Okay, but, okay, but how many how many are you gonna make, KJ? How many are you gonna make, you think? What's the number? Um I'll 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 say the lowest I'll go 50, and the highest I'll be around like 65, 70 mm -hmm. if I'm hot. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think for me, I think the bar would be 70. And then I'm putting myself at at least 85. At least, nah, at least 85, 90. I, I, I truly believe that. Just especially, you know, I've because I've done like the JJ Reddick shooting drill. I've, you know, I've done a couple of different, like, you know, get up as many shots as you can in a minute. So I've kind of seen where I'm at. And I that's that's where I feel confident in that. I respect that, Ruler. I really do. I love what it. what the real question is what are you shooting yes <laughs> like me personally right now y- yes yeah. sir i mean i might be able to hit 55 to 60 probably three point lines a long way away when you get old man <laughs> you still got to the, get the ball memory. all the way there you still got the muscle memory Come no on it's now. hard to yeah. get the ball all the way there but like on our team we have a range of of probably guys that like at will average somewhere in the in the mid 70s down to guys that will average in the low in, in the maybe even a little bit below 50 type of deal like just depending but but um yeah it's it is it's also interesting like just because some guys that can really just stand there and shoot them might not be able to shoot contested or on the move or types of stuff like that but it's a great way to again trying to build confidence in our shooters trying to just get them to perfect their shooting release type of deal. all right is that is that your last question that's my, that's my question let's go let's go rapid fire all right, Ruda, lock him in. Okay, so my first question is going to be top three college point guards of all time. Top three college point guards of all time. Oh, my gosh. Um, I'm a huge North Carolina Tar Heel fan, so I'm only going Tar Heels. I'm going uh, Ty Lawson. I'm going uh, Raymond Felton, and I'm going Ed Cota. <laughs> okay, I like okay. those. I, like I those. respect it. Uh, it's definitely, I'm not agreeing with the UNC though. Let's go Q's every every day, <laughs> even though we just got bounced earlier uh, to NC State. Okay, my next question: favorite hmm. midnight snack? Favorite midnight snack? It's gonna be uh, peanut butter and jelly. Okay, that's a classic. Never miss it. Never hmm. miss it. And then my last rapid fire question for you: I want you to say your favorite album. But there's a little bit of a caveat on this. I'm kind of looking for an album that might be unpopular that someone's like, oh, that's your favorite album, but you will die on that hill. Like, I love it, and no one could tell me different. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> an unpopular favorite album. I don't know. I don't have it. I got I got nothing for you on this, man. Okay. Favorite um, album, then, just in general. Favorite uh, album. I have a favorite album that, that is unpopular. I mean, people like that are, are, are huge Tom Petty fans are going to be like, how could you say his greatest hits album is his best? Best album, you know, or something like that. And other people <laughs> might be like Tom Petty. What the hell? Um, so I'm gonna, I'll, 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 I'll say Tom Petty's greatest hits. <laughs> okay, all right. I respect it. All right, so this edition of the starting five. So as a coach, if you're picking your point guard through center, um, who you picking? And then this edition is going to be player your dream ideal players to play in the system. Mm. Okay. You guys gonna help me out with this too? No, this is just, this is just you. Yeah, yeah. Man, you've been doing all this research on the system and stuff. You can't help me out with anything. <laughs> all right, we'll give I, you I, one I, each. We'll give you one each. All right, that's you, valid. You do three. All right, all right. Um, Wait, what position do you want us to get? You guys pick. I want point guard. Okay. I'll take. I'll take. I'll take small forward. Okay. I'm. I'm starting, and I'm gonna say Jack Taylor. Uh, okay. I love it. <laughs> All right. Uh, now you go your two. No, coach, go two, and then Ruta go three, and then we'll finish with four. This is five. like any this is like any player any level. Uh, yeah. Anywhere. You just went Jack Taylor over like Steve Nash, for example. I'm picking Jack Taylor. He scored 138 points in the system. 138 he twice. He scored what, 100 twice. Yeah. <laughs> what can what can I say, man? What can I say? Absolutely, he did. Uh okay, I'm gonna take Steph Curry and put him at the two. I like it. I have no idea why this player just came to me, but Kenyon Martin, I think that, really? I think that was his name. He used to play for the Kings and the Rock. Tim Timberwolves, I'm pretty sure. He used to get up a bunch of threes, moving around off screens, all that good stuff. Okay. So yeah. that's, a, that's an interesting pick, but I like it. He had kind of like a funky little little shooting stroke too, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, at the center, I mean – for sure, I just have to go win Binyama because this dude's going to play the back <laughs> press. 
He's gonna and block shots like crazy. Everything. He's gonna he's gonna sh- he's gonna hit trail threes. Yeah. Exactly what we need him to do. And <laughs> how could we how could we not have any a five with him not on the floor? That'd be incredible mm-hmm. to watch. <laughs> and then power forward, uh, power forward. We need like we need a glue guy. We don't need anybody that can score. We actually need somebody that does not want the basketball in their hands in <laughs> any way, shape, or form. Just wants to rebound, screen, stay the heck out of the way. Who's coming to mind here, fellas? We can we can go we can go join on this one. I think I'm thinking Draymond, but I don't know who you're thinking. Draymond would be fantastic. He can pass as well. He's as as it's perfect. It's somebody like that. It's or it's somebody like. I don't know, Kenneth Fareed, somebody like uh, Brandon Clark from, from the Grizzlies. He's injured right now, but he's pretty Brandon, good. Brandon Clark's just going to be around the rim, catching lobs, dunking, you know, like like getting all these hustle offensive boards. Perfect. Yeah, I think I think Draymond's the play, though, because he's also got that connection with Curry, too. Yeah, it's going to help. <laughs> and yeah. he's going to protect Jack Taylor, too. I know Jack Taylor like five times a little bit, so someone might try to bully him. Draymond Green going to be there. <laughs> I don't know what you do. That's a great starting five. That's a great starting five right there. I love it. But this is going to do it for another episode of Not Even D2. We really appreciate this. might be my favorite episode. I'm not going to lie. But appreciate you joining. And um, good luck to you for next season. Thank you guys for having me. Best of luck to both of you as well. Look forward to, to following you guys. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Not Even D2. If you haven't already, make sure to go follow all the socials at Not Even D2. You can catch every episode on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm your host, KJ Allison, and I'll see you next episode.